at this topic, we're going to be talking about prospective investor call best practices. Now, we're going to be talking a little bit about the, our call funnel, uh, the outline, more so on the outline for your calls and the, the investor call mindset, uh, talking about different practices in terms of just controlling the call, what to be prepared to answer, but then also some of the most important questions to ask when you're on the call to be able to pull information and then also best practices on what happens after the call in order in order for you to uh, keep in touch and keep that engagement with these prospective investors. Now, a little bit about myself. I am Taylor Koo, one of the investor relations associates here at PassiveInvesting.com. Uh, those are uh, this is my dad's side on the left side, and then my mom's side and grandparents on the right side. And so I've been with PassiveInvesting.com for a little over a year and a half now. I've had about 400 investor calls, and of those 400 investor Call uh, about fifteen million in in capital raised, and so it's it's been a a daily daily routine of just getting into these calls and just having to go through a number of different I guess dealing with different personalities experiences, but the general notion is a lot of these calls happen to be very very similar, and it's for a reason. But before we dive into the actual call, though, uh, let's just talk about what happens before the call. There's typically that lead magnet that comes in. We we use Active Campaign. We're actually switching over to HubSpot, but there's that lead form capture where it captures their information, uh, that's their name, email, accreditation information, and then they schedule a call and then they get a reminder. And when they get a reminder or that email confirmation, they would get something like this that you would see on the right side. Welcome to the Impassive Investor Club and just letting them know what to expect when they're on the call with you. Now, before we go into the call, I, I remember when I was first starting to hop onto the call, I it was very much so uh, focused, or I, I had this mindset where I felt like I needed to pitch. I needed to sell them on an opportunity. Uh, but what I've realized, though, is, and especially within this industry and in, in syndications, is that within these investor calls, you really are building a relationship. These transactions can happen anywhere between three to seven or even 10 years. And so when people are looking to invest, they're looking to invest with the operator, with the people. And so it and that's how we should be framing the call is really focused on building that relationship and building that trust. And in a way, if you think about this, it's it's you're using this pricing frame, right? Even though these people have the capital to invest in the deal, and let's say, I mean, we need the capital for the deal, we also have the opportunity. And so as much as they're vetting me, I'm also vetting them too, just to see if our goals align, if we have the same risk tolerance, and if there really is that trusting relationship right off the bat. And keep in mind that this, these trusting relationships are going to take time. And so this call is really just supposed to be for that discovery call to learn about them. But what they're really looking for in that first call is, are you a reliable person? Are you competent and are you trustworthy? Now, when I first started in the in, in these calls too, I also felt like I needed to prove my, my knowledge to them um, and try and just splurge as much terminology as I could. Um, but in a sense, you'd really just have to give them what they're asking for. They schedule a call with you in the first place. They have a specific goal for the call give them what they ask for, and then educate them and give them all the information to make sure that they're able to make the best decision for themselves, which making the decision to invest in a deal, I mean, it might happen that first call, but more than likely it's going to happen on the second, third, or fourth call. And like I said, people care more about the who, keep it high level. And then also um, when you are going into the call, understand that people love stories. And so I'll actually dive into the people love stories a little bit more uh, later on into the into the slide deck. And then as we are talking to, we just have to keep it simple. It's the whole kiss method. Uh, keep it simple and then keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> and just because if you just go along this 
well, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, but the other thing too, when you are jumping, jumping into these calls with these investors, you have to also understand that when you do hop on these calls, you have to adapt to your audience because the you're going to have to figure out who they are and then cater what the conversation is going to look like throughout the call. And, the, and these people can have a number of different experiences and, and even personalities. They could be completely new to syndications. They could be seasoned passive investors where they just know what they're looking for. They could also be active operators as well. They could You could run into somebody that has that type A personality that's trying to take control of the call and just start uh, firing questions at you. And then you might have just the shy investor that's literally just there to listen. And it feels like you're just talking to a wall <laughs> and you're just giving information. You're not really sure if they're, if they're, if they're taking it in. Right. So you're going to come across a, a number of different investors. And, you know, as you go through these different calls, you're going to start to get better at figuring out you know, how to cater the conversation, uh, but generally it's still the same structure and format and workflow that we've been going through regardless of the experience and personalities. Now, talking about the actual call, these are the six steps in terms of the call workflow. So you're going to establish your time frame. You're going to go through the discovery phase, go through a little bit about yourself, go through any questions, then you're going to establish those expectations, then nurture and the investor after that through a, a number of different follow-ups. Now, the first portion of the call, I always called them. And the reason I always call them is I want to take control of the conversation right from the get-go. I want to show them that I'm punctual, that I'm prompt. I want to show them that you know we, we mean business. And so calling them allows you to, uh, gives you the, the upper hand, at least in terms of just taking control of the conversation right from the get-go. Now, when I, when I do hop on the call, I, I first say something like, hi, is this you know, Talia? And uh, this is Taylor with PassiveInvesting.com. How's it going? And then afterwards, I would establish the time frame. Now, this is also really key and really important too. So because it lets them know that you are busy as well and you still have calls after this, but then also it lets the investor or the other person on the line know that they're only going to be tied in for those 15 minutes. Now, even though I say 15 minutes, I always allocate 30 minutes afterwards, just or about 15 minutes extra. So a total of 30 minutes because the calls generally go a little bit longer, but I want to them I want to let them know that I I am I am also busy. This is a conversation. We also in um, I, I I need to move on. Like we got to make sure that we're using the the best use of our time. And so I would say something something along the lines of is is now still a good time to chat. This call should only be for fifteen minutes. They say, yes, we're good. And then I would go into the discovery phase. Now, the discovery phase, I actually have them kick off the call. I don't even go into myself, but I say something along the lines of, since this is our first time chatting, I'd actually love if you can kick off our call and let me know a little bit more about yourself, what you do work-wise, real estate investing experience, and investment goals. Now, the reason why I ask these three questions uh, is because I just really want to get an idea of who the other person is that I'm talking about. They'll talk about if they're new to syndications or if they're active, um, and if you know if they're if they're seasoned or if they're looking for a particular thing. Um, but even when they go into that, though, I, I ask I ask a follow a few follow up questions. Now, uh, the the the, the f I would say one of the first questions I ask is if they're looking for uh, cash flow and that supplemental income or that back end equity. The reason why I ask that is it gives me just a, an idea of what type of deals that they really like and seeing if our opportunities can align with their goals. So like if they're looking for cash flow and and they're relying on those monthly distributions, 
and I have a development deal, I mean, obviously it's not going to work. If they're looking for a more backend equity and they don't care about the cash flow, then the development deal can work. If they're looking for a blend of both, it gives you a little bit more opportunities. But really what this is, is you're taking in information, right? Something else that I also like to ask as well is if they're focusing on a particular asset class. And oftentimes they'll say they're open, um, but uh, in, or they might just be familiar with, let's say, multifamily, familiar with just storage. And so that can give you a little bit more, I guess, preparedness later on in the call if they do ask and are curious to know about that asset class and how it works. And also when you are getting through these different types of questions, you're also going to understand their risk tolerance. Uh, they're, I mean, they're going to, I mean, pretty often these are like the only questions that I really ask, but they'll, they'll go into some of those, those challenges that they have been having either, whether it's with the stock market or even other operators and what they're really, um, and just, I guess, like what they're really going for. Now, after, oh, and then actually something else that I do in the discovery phase, I also, and I didn't put this down, I also ask how they found out about us and then how familiar they are with us. And I mean, how they found out about us could be podcast, could be webinar, could be referral. If it is a referral, always make sure that you take the name of that person down that referred over and then shoot them a thank you it's for like. It could even be, a, this is something that we do, like send over a message or do you even like a handwritten card just saying like, thank you for this referral. And um, just because, I mean, referrals are some of the best leads that we can get, right? So you want to get that information down as well so you can thank that person that referred over to them. And then when I ask them how familiar they are with us, it lets me know if, I mean, if they are really familiar with us and they've been following us with us following us for a long time. And then I don't need to go into this overview or summary about us. And uh, then we can just go straight into the questions, which can keep the call short. But if they aren't familiar with us, then I can go through the, the hits, uh, the overview and summary of just who we are. Now, when I go over the overview and summary of who we are, I just want to make sure that there is, uh, this is, this is just kind of like the preface of how I structure or how we structure the summary. So we go over the asset class, the who, the market, the markets that we're investing in, and then also what they can expect from us in the future. And understand when you are talking about the overview, there should be an emphasis on the who, because, and especially within this industry too, uh, I mean, people are investing in people that they know, like, and trust. And so that's, there's a reason why I spend about, I would say, even just a large portion of that summary that is uh, allocated towards just who we are as a team and then highlighting that track record. So uh, I'll give you just a little synopsis of what I say when I am talking uh, to to these investors and giving them just an overview about us. Passiveinvesting.com, we are a private equity real estate investment firm focused on five different asset classes. Institutional quality multifamily, these are your suburban class A or B plus type assets, typically 2016 or newer. And even at times we've bought them directly from the developer, but we don't do any ground up development as of yet. We're also focused on storage, express car washes, hotels, and then we have a debt fund as well, which is our more liquid option compared to our other investment opportunities. Our two managing partners are Dan Hanford and Danny Randazzo. Some background behind those two. Dan Hanford, the first managing partner, he actually got his start as a chiropractor. He had his own practice, wanted to scale up, ended up scaling to four practices debt-free, but ran into the issue of just writing very large tax checks to the government. And so he wanted to find a more tax advantage way of building wealth, got to start as a passive investor first in apartment buildings. Now, even though he's transitioned full-time into our business to oversee all of our strategic objectives for the firm, he's still a passive investor in 80 different deals with 17 different groups like ourselves. And so for us, he takes his skills in scaling and operating these seven and eight figure businesses while also utilizing his experience as a passive investor to improve our investor experience here at the firm. 
Second managing partner is Danny Randazzo, formerly a financial consultant for Deloitte. Was, he was traveling the world, advising companies on their profits and operations. It came to a point where his family was tired of him being away from home so much. So he started investing in apartment buildings in 2013, was able to quit his job in 2018. Now he's full-time in our business to oversee all of our financial analysis and underwriting across all of our assets. And then alongside those two, you have a full-time team of 50 employees that covers all areas of the business, from acquisitions to investor relations to investor services. And we look to provide opportunities primarily in the Sunbelt Southeast with a couple markets on the other side of the nation, depending on the asset class. These markets include North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, Texas, Tennessee, Denver, Colorado, and Boise, Idaho. Since we got our start as a firm in 2018, and that is just the year that we came together, they were either working for other firms beforehand or as their own operators. But since 2018, we have gone full cycle on eight deals. All of those deals were underwritten for five years, but we have exited those on average three years or less, an average to return of 26.1% IRR. Now, moving forward, we currently have two opportunities available. There's Pick Storage 2, and then we have our debt fund, which, of course, is always going to be open. And then for the rest of the year, we're anticipating seven to eight more opportunities, and that can be a mix of the asset classes. And scene. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so the reason why I wanted to at least address all of those different points is because you just want to get those easy questions out of the way. And then you can get really into the details and, and also into the goals of what the investor is trying to accomplish from the actual call, right? So when you do hop into the questions, you want to keep it high level. This isn't a time, uh, and this this happens especially for the people that are newer to syndications. This isn't a time to this this isn't a time to uh, go really deep into the numbers and explain what internal rate of return or explain. I mean, you can explain what an internal rate of return is, and you can't explain what a preferred return is, but it's not <laughs> it's not the time to go like really analytical here. Uh, and it's something that I that I definitely do is I I always have these like articles in my back pocket. So it's like if it's I, I explain something in, that is, um, I guess like easy, right? The terminology like about the preferred return or about the internal rate of return or about bonus depreciation. But I have these articles in the back of my pocket so I can send those after the call. But you want to address them in a very simple way. Keep it high level and. Just focus on, you know, understanding where they're coming from and, and learning more about them. But these are some of the questions that come across. I mean, they're going to ask you about your track record. Definitely don't lie if you don't have a track record. But if you are partnered up with uh, several individuals that do have the track record, definitely leverage their experience if you, you're starting out new. Um, understand why. People should invest with you over other operators. Uh, now, this one, this question does come come up a lot, and it's well, especially now since there are several operators that are going through uh, capital calls during this economic environment. Uh, but this question: Has there ever been a time where you've not performed or failed to meet projections? Now, it's the the most important part about this is not the fact that you have, let's say, had a capital call, but it's really the story about how you overcame the challenges or or failed. Have you overcame the challenges to um, meet, I guess, the these projections or what you learned from it in moving forward? Uh, because, I mean, people can understand that operators aren't always perfect, but they want to be able to see that they can trust you making the best decision for their investments. And, and so something that I do is I make sure I, I highlight it, I highlight it in a story. So something that I would say along these lines is now, although we have never had a capital call or failed to meet our projections, we've always exceeded our investors' expectations. I'm not going to sit here and say that we are perfect operators either. And we definitely go through our own set of obstacles. And one of the obstacles that really came to mind was one of our earlier acquisitions, Braxton at Briar Creek, which we have gone full cycle now. 
Braxton and Briar Creek was a C-class asset. We were looking, to, it was a, a, a typical you know, workforce housing value add, uh, bringing a C-class to a B minus. And we budgeted 14,000 in renovation costs and wanted to increase rent uh, by about $300. Now, what we did was we renovated two of the prop two of the units on the property and then brought those out to market to test the market. And we at that the $300 rent premium, but the thing is we heard nothing. We brought the rent premium down from $300 to $250. We still heard nothing. We brought the rent premium down to $200. We still heard nothing. And we find that finally found that sweet spot of a $170 rent increase. And so what we had to do was we had to actually go back to our uh, to our renovation budget, and we were able to cut down and prioritize our renovation costs from fourteen thousand to about seven thousand. And so we were still able to meet our projections and exceed our investors' expectations. But that was a huge learning lesson for us, just to one, be more knowledgeable of the market, and then also to be a lot more conservative in our underwriting. So highlighting stories like that can help incite trust because now it's almost like you're in. There's that inciting, just that emotional, I guess, trigger that we as humans just have, right? Other questions that that come along is, you know, are there tax benefits? Do your do your opportunities offer bonus depreciation? How frequently are these distributions going to be happening? How is how are people responding to rising interest rates and what's currently going on with your current your current assets? They'll ask about the fees business plan and exit strategy, and then the average hold period. Now, if it, I'm, we're going to be sending over this presentation after this, but these are generally the same exact questions that I get on almost every single call, whether they are experienced or not experienced. So definitely take a snapshot of this or you know reread this and then think through your different answers of how you'd respond um, in this way. And then also to just at the bottom, uh, and I mentioned this in the beginning, definitely keep pre pre written articles handy just so you can send them afterwards and have just a separate follow up conversation on them. But just something really important is you don't want to go into the rabbit hole of just trying to explain all of this terminology, which is going to let then lead you to explaining another term that just happened to come up when you're explaining the terminology in the first place, keep it high level. There's something about just having that quiet confidence when you're on the call and not having to prove to the investor that you know your stuff. And then after the call, I tell them what they can expect from us and then I do it. And, and, and I show them that I can execute. So I'd say something along the lines of, now that we've had this call, you're now considered part of our passive investor club. So you'll be receiving emails on all of our new opportunities, our master classes, and also any events that we're going to have in your area. I'm going to send you a follow-up email with a number of resources, our open opportunities and recently closed opportunities, just so you can get some familiarity all across the board. And then I'll that send you a text confirmation with my contact card. And in my contact card, it'll have my number, email, LinkedIn profile. This is my direct number, but in case any questions do come up, you can shoot me a text, give me a call. It's not like you need to schedule on a Calendly link anymore. Well, I guess unless you really like, but it's it's really is whatever's easiest for you to communicate. And so then call ends and then I do exactly that and something that these investors really want to see is that you can execute and communicate well. And surprisingly, so with uh, and Dan talks about this all the time, is especially considering he's involved in so many other passive deals. Communication is one of the biggest ways that you can separate yourself from other operators, being accessible, being transparent being able to address any of those questions that do come up, uh, it makes a difference. Even And even based on that first impression, they'll be able to have that first impression and take on those expectations and, and sort of envision what they can expect while they're investing with you. And then afterwards, uh, you get into the whole nurturing 
stage. So, I mean, they'll be a part of your email marketing campaigns, text campaigns. You can even send, if you have physical newsletters, definitely send over those physical newsletters or webinars. I mean, there's so many different ways that you can uh, keep them engaged and keep them involved, but just understand that that first call, most likely they're not going to just invest right then and there. They're going to want to look through the social proof, figure out if they know, like, and trust to you. And it, I mean, everybody is really on their own time frame. Oops. Yeah, everybody's on their on their own time frame of when they want to invest and what they're looking to accomplish.